Today we're showing you how we coded this table twice. We had to recode it due to some issues, but we're showing you the whole process. It's a full tutorial on how we coded this old table to give it a fresh new look. Check it out. Okay, so this table is ready to be coded. We're gonna be doing our Ligari stone kit process on it by buying all the items from our online store under single items. So you guys can go to Ligari.com, get all the products in this video to recreate this exact look. First thing we did was obviously level the table. Um, actually, no, that's not true. First thing we did was, I'll see if I can tilt this up. Can't really see under there, so. But what we did, it had a big bow in it, okay? So we added these metal bars, screwed those in to straighten this table out, and this thing was just haggard. So we had the laminate was peeling off, it had some water damage. So I had land and sand it, 80 grit sandpaper, and it also has the rubber trim on the edges. We also sanded that. Um, by sanding that, it kind of left a bunch of little burrs sticking out. Um, I think we used 120 grit. Obviously, if you sand with like a 220, 320, you're not gonna get those burrs, but I wanted to see if we could um, coat those. Um, and then if we have to, if they're still sticking out of the resin after we coat it, we can slightly sand that before we do the top coat. So I kind of wanted to do that to test it. And again, we've never done one of these. Um, it's really no different than like a piece of MDF, um, but obviously, being an old table like this, it has a lot of wear and use. I mean, it's got some pits, pits in it, some gouges. So our stone kits go on a lot thicker, about eight ounces per square foot. So that's gonna help hide all of this. So primed it, taped our edges, two row of tape. And then I went around and I creased in the top because there's not a lot of edge to tape to. So I kind of creased it in there. So now the tape's kind of stuck on the top as well. So that should help it from any blowouts or resin running. But this is ready, level both ways. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, um, I didn't level it, but it should be level both ways. So now we can go mix. This is ready to go. Once we mix, we can come and do the stone kit process on this table. Okay, so pretty much have everything we need here. Gloves, products. We got a gallon and a half of resin. Again, we're doing eight ounces per square foot. And you can times your square footage by eight, and that'll give you how many ounces of resin you need to make. So I have my clear containers to mix all these separate colors in, um, and then also do the dirty pour process into those. I got some denatured alcohol and some rags just in case I spill anything. And then it's really, really cold out, so what I did is set the jugs in some warm water for about a half an hour. Now it's kind of cooled down, so it'll be a little easier to work with. And then I'm gonna go over mixing. So we call it 3P2. You go up and down three times, you pour into a secondary bucket, and then you go up and down two more times. That ensures there's no soft spots, there's no unmixed resin, because we always start out adding the part A. Part A gets covered on all the sides. Then we dump the part B in, and unless you can scrape the sides really good, the bottom really good, um, sometimes you'll get soft spots where the resin's not mixed fully, and that's just not a good way to finish a project. So by doing this process that we came up with, it ensures that you'll always have perfectly mixed resin without any issues. So part A, we're gonna drain it out for a second, and we'll tilt it back, let all the resin in the handle flow out. And then we're gonna let this drain until it slowly starts to drip. Now we're gonna add our hardener. Same thing, tilt it back. All right, now I'm gonna go up and down two t uh, three times. And we're gonna pour into the secondary bucket and do the same thing. When I go to the bottom, I go around a couple times. And when I get to the top, I go around a couple times and this is what it looks like. Notice I'm not worried about inducing air into our mix. It's formulated to self-release air and bubbles in the mix. So now I'm gonna dump this into the secondary container. And then we're gonna scrape as much out as we can get and do that two more times. Mix, mix it up and down two more times. So I scrape the bottom, I scrape the sides, get as much out as you can. And then we go up and down two more times and this is ready to go.
All right, there's that. And then what I always do, cooler guard tip is to keep your paddles clean. I'm gonna grab our bucket of denatured alcohol. And I'm gonna spin this off in here, forward and reverse a couple times and then wipe out the rag and this paddle will be perfectly clean. Quick wipe. Now I don't have to worry about chunks of resin that dry out on there and falling off in our mix. So we're gonna open these colors, see what these guys got me. I do know there's black in there, but I don't know any other ones. So we got silver, brass, deep blue, sky blue, black. So we got two blacks. So you guys can do as many colors as you want. Obviously if you're doing like three colors, you're gonna need a more, a larger color pack, right? So um, these smalls will do about three, three quarts of resin. And the easiest way to figure it out is I got a gallon and a half. I got six color packs basically, um, actually five, because I got two blacks. So we divide that by um, five, uh, 192 ounces divided by five. Let me just double check my math here. 128 ounces in a gallon, and a gallon plus a half a gallon would be 64. So yeah, so 192, we have six color packs. You divide it by your color pack, sorry. So six color packs, so we're gonna divide that by six, and that gives us 32 ounces. So I need to make, separate this into six cups with 32 ounces in it, and then I can add my colors. Now an easy way to do this would be to separate these four into 32 ounces, and then I add my two blacks into the leftover, which would be the same, but I don't have to waste two more cups. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do four cups at 32 ounces, and since these are only 24 ounces, we're not gonna use them until we do the, the dirty pour um, mixing. So, 32. 32. Maybe a little high, but that's all right. We're close. Get two more containers here. It doesn't have to be exact. We're just trying to get it close. Okay, so now theoretically, I have 64 ounces in that for the black, and then these all have 32 ounces. So I'm gonna dump the colors in, and again, this is a little more pigment than we need, but. And we'll do the two blacks in here. All right, now we're gonna mix them because we've already mixed the clear resin up. So we don't have to try to pour out 32 ounces of A and B and try to figure all that out. These are just ready to go, just gotta blend the colors. I'm gonna start with the lightest color, which is probably the sky blue. Go to silver, deep blue, the brass, and then I'm gonna go to the black. All right, and then I'll clean my paddle off the same way I did the big one. That way we keep this thing clean. All right, now we're ready to mix and match all these colors. So the smaller batches you do, the tighter veins, the more intricate designs you'll get. If you're doing big old batches, they're not gonna be as crazy of like tones of color and stuff coming out. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do quite a few here. I'll start off with the black. I'll just button these up, so I'll just pour right down the middle here. All right guys, so you wanna move fast. Obviously we have resin sitting in containers, right? 
I could get some more cups out and finish all these up, but I'm just gonna go dump these out, bring them back, fill them back up. So we're gonna go start doing that right now. And I don't wanna just pour out one cup in one area. I wanna pour it out kinda of all over the board. I'm kind of taking note of what color's coming out as to where I'm putting it, right? Had a lot of blues come out, so I want to get some blues in areas that aren't that color of blue. So what I'm doing now is just adding stuff where there's no resin. I don't want to just keep pouring on spots that have resin. I'm going to go in and start filling in areas now. All right, so I want to, we got a good even color everywhere, but I want to make, see what, what color I'm going to get coming out, which I think is going to be like a brass. So I'm gonna go around and get those in spots that doesn't really have that color. All right guys, so it's time to pull the tape. It's been about 45 minutes. Some of these, we got some leaks here and there, but for taping over a rubber edge, pretty impressive. So when I'm, when I'm looking for the right time to pull the tape, we'll go to this side that's kind of stuck still. What I always do is I'll pull this back Right? And then as long as that stuff's slowly dripping over, so it's slowly moving. If it's running real quick, it's a little too early. So you want it to slowly drip. Now keep in mind, if you have like a thick face, maybe like a four inch, three inch thick edge, you're gonna wanna pull it a little sooner. That way that can flow over and coat it. But this is just about the right time. So we're gonna pull this off. It's gonna get messy. So we're gonna wad this up as we go. Let that set up. And the last thing we do is we just run our hand while they're dirty all on the edge to kind of slick it off. That way that can flow over nice and even. And don't worry about messing up your design because you're going to have resin flow over and coat it again. We just want to make sure it's all slicked off with the resin. Get a little bit, drip down, rub it on there. You can kind of see the burrs from sand in the the rubber probably sh should have used a fine sandpaper so what we'll do is if those are still showing we'll kind of lightly sand it by hand with 220 before the top coat and knock those off so last thing we'll do is let this set up for a little bit scrape the drips and then we'll top coat it once it's dry so we had a little issue here um, I had Landon sand the board because we waited longer than 24 hours to apply the top coat and while he was sanding the drips off it started peeling off the rubber edge and I talked about um, never coating over a rubber edge before but I wanted to show you guys um, that that didn't work with our WB primer now we have prep replacement primer that is, is made to bond to a, a little bit more array of services so we'll have to try that to see if that works but the WB primer did not bond to the rubber, so take note of that. And if you come around here, I'll kind of show you what happened. So here's the edge, it's just peeling off because it has that rubber edge. It's one of those old tables. So it's literally just peeling right off of that rubber edge, right? And then I kind of got a little wild and then just started ripping it up. But the cool thing is when this rips up, it's actually pulling the wood so here's a piece I think yeah this piece was right here 
and it ripped up the layer they had over the wood. Um, so the primer bonded to that, but I wanna make sure we rip up any loose spots. So I'm gonna go through and just start ripping up any of these spots that are coming up. And you can see, cause we did black primer on this. That's not black. So we're ripping up whatever was on here before, even after sanding. And if I coat this again, my plan is to rip this rubber off and it should have a little gap in the middle that I'll have to fill. See if I can get a spot out of here for you. Yep, so I'm gonna rip this off. We're gonna fill that seam, sand it, router the edge, and then we'll recoat it and won't have any issues. But obviously rubber, not, not many things will stick to rubber. So that's kind of what happened. So we're gonna get this thing prepped again and we're gonna recoat it because we don't wanna send something out, um, especially for a buddy of ours that he's gonna have an issue with it peeling. So we'll get to work on this and then we're gonna coat it again. So now we're getting down to the primer part and you can see it's ripping up the wood. So all this is the sheeting that was on it still. This is where it was sanded off and it's just ripping up chunks of wood. So that primer sticks amazing to wood surfaces. All right guys, so you're probably wondering why we're putting so much time redoing this table again, trying to make it perfect. Um, it's just one of those cheap old school fold up tables. Um, and it's because it's for an AA group and a lot of the guys have been picking at the tables. Um, they go in there um, to, get, to get help and their tables are just all thrashed. So we wanted, they came in and um, we, we know the guy that runs it. He's like, hey man, you think you could do these tables? And we're like, sure, we'll hook you up. We'll do something cool on them. That way when they come in there, it's a little bit better of an environment that they have now. So that's kind of why we're doing this. Um, and what we wound up doing is just taking the, the old particle board top that was on it and just rebuilt it. That way we didn't have to fill in that seam where the metal, metal was. Um, and it's just a lot better wood. We use some high-end plywood. Um, and so this thing's gonna be real stout. We still put those metal, uh, that metal railing under here to add rigidity and support for this table. So this thing will hold up and probably last 10, 20 years. Who knows how long this thing's gonna last for them, but it's gonna be a lot better than what they had. So that's kind of where we're at now. So we, we re rebuilt the table basically. Um, and now I'm just gonna do the same process again. I'm gonna prime it again, mix the resin up. I'm gonna mix the resin the same way. I might switch up the colors a little bit. Um, and then I think I'm gonna tape the edge different. I'm gonna tape the edge like we did on our uh, art panels, um, those big art panels that we did. If you guys didn't see that video, um, we'll put a link down there so you guys can watch a really, really cool process. Um, but I'm gonna wind up using weather stripping tape on the top because whenever you're taping a, a, a skinny edge, um, a lot of times you'll get blowouts when you're doing our stone kit process and we don't want to do that. So I'm going to do the, the, the weather stripping on this. That way when we pull the tape, there's no blowouts and the design stays exactly the same as it would um, if we were doing like a thick edge and we were able to tape that off to hold that design there. So with that being said, I'm going to prime this. I'll mix up the resin and then we'll just probably show you guys doing the actual stone kit dirty pour process. All right, so like I said before, since we're redoing this, I mix it all the same. It's basically ready to pour, but I wanted to talk about how I did my taping my edges different. I used the weather stripping um, instead of the tape because whenever you're taping on a thin edge, a lot of times you'll get um, runoffs of the resin because there's not a big lip for that tape to, to sit on there. So I like to tape on the top. And since we're doing our stone kit process, we do twice as much resin. We do, instead of four ounces a square foot, we do eight ounces a square foot. And so there's plenty enough, there, there's plenty of product to run over that edge once we pull it on the top. But I always go around, I do blue tape first, about a, a quarter inch on the top. That way I have somewhere to tape to put the weather stripping. So I, I did the perimeter quarter inch in um, with the blue tape and then I take the weather stripping and we put that right on the top edge. Um, that way it's easy to pull. Blue tape pulls off stuff real easy. So we, we do the blue tape, weather stripping, um, and then now we have basically a dam created all around this board. So when we're ready to pull it, um, we'll pull it and then that'll let the resin flow over the edge and coat your edges. So that's kind of the process on that. 
I'm gonna do the stone kit the same, or this pour the same way. I'm gonna start out doing my designs. When I get closer and closer to running out of product, I wanna be more methodical and I wanna pour in between all the designs. I don't wanna pour right next to it. I wanna to try to fill as much as I can without touching it. Um, um, and so when I get down to that last batch, another thing, as I'm pouring it, I'm always watching for the colors that are coming out because say I have a bunch of blue over here and not very much there. Well, if I get here and I see a bunch of blue coming out of the cup, I'm gonna stop and run over to this side and pour some out there. So I'm always keeping a close eye of what colors are coming out and where I might wanna put other colors. But other than that, this process is really simple. It's fast, it's fun, and it always looks phenomenal. So we're gonna get ready and uh, start re-pouring this. All right guys, so when you're doing our stone kit process, which uses the dirty pour technique, um, the smaller pours, the smaller cups you use and the more times you're pouring um, out of, right? Like, like if I did dirty pours out of this, I'm not gonna get as tight up fracture veins, right? Or, or more of a cool design. If you do smaller cups, the colors aren't gonna blend as much because you're not dumping as much into them at a time and you're gonna get a lot more um, design and colors are gonna stay a lot tighter, a lot smaller veins, stuff like that. So just keep that in mind. And the other thing I didn't hit on, you really wanna make sure your weather stripping is pressed down really good everywhere. Um, just double check that right before you start, run around, press everything down good, and then you guys should be golden. All right, we're going back, going back to that gold effects. It's never steered me wrong. And I'm gonna save a little bit for when we're actually pouring these out. All right, we got a little bit left in these. I'll save that in case I want to do some, some solid color veins throughout it. So I want to use a lot more of this. I want some more of this gold to pop. So I'm going to spray some, I'm going to pour some out right on the top here. And then you'll see it'll come out pretty, pretty dominant. So I want to make sure I, I'll kind of crease this guy up and we'll kind of run some gold spots through there. All right, so like I said before, now I got a lot of this filled, so now I want to be more precise of where I'm pouring out. And so I'm just trying to fill in spots now. I'm getting black coming out, so wherever I want to do black, I'm going to go through and hit those spots. So 
so what I'm going to do now, like you can see all the spots where I just kind of stopped and poured, I'm going to just kind of blend these in so they just don't look like blobs of just stopping and starting. And I'm going to pat in all my dry spots before I pour this last cup. And I'll, I'll show you why when I'm done. Because there's plenty of resin here for it to level out and fill these spots. You just got to get rid of that surface tension. It's kind of holding the resin back. All right, now I'm just going to fine tune any spots that look like kind of like a puddle was poured out. I don't like that squiggly mark there. I'm going to blend that. All right, guys, so I got everything filled. Now I'm going to pinch this and just run long patterns following one of my designs. Guess we got a double vein here. So you can really fine tune any spot you want. Blend it more. If I wanted to get rid of some of this gold, I could just blend that with my finger. Um, real, real forgiving process. So once you get it how you want it, kind of fine tune your spots, any blobs or puddles, all right, blend those in. And then we're gonna just spritz it with isopropyl alcohol. This will create a lot of cells out there. If you, if you wanna stay away from the cell look, um, don't spritz it like I am. Just hit it with denatured alcohol, mist it and that won't make it sell out like this. And a lot of these will kind of dissipate too once it, once it starts to level out and marbleize. So what I always like to do is after we do the isopropyl, let it sit and evaporate for about 10 minutes, and then we go through and mist it with denatured alcohol, um, and then we'll let this sit here for probably a half hour, 45 minutes, and then we'll pull the tape. And the reason we're doing the tape and the, the dam around the perimeter is because if, I, if we didn't, this resin probably from out here would kind of flow over and level out over the edge. It would mess up our design. So the reason we dam these off, let the resin set up. So when we pull it, it doesn't move. It doesn't take away and make our design kind of fade out and have runs in it and stuff like that. So that's the whole point. Let it set up, pull the tape. Then it's a lot thicker. Less is going to flow off. You're also not wasting a bunch of resin and it keeps the same exact design that we have right now. So to get the, the resin glass smooth like this, after we spray the isopropyl, we let that evaporate for 10 minutes and then we mist the entire surface with the denatured alcohol and that'll eliminate any of the champagne bu bubbles, any air that might be in the resin. It, 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 it makes it easier for it to release and pop, even though our resin already has additives to allow the, the air to release and self pop. We like to mist it with the denatured alcohol when we're finished um, and that just creates a glass smooth finish on it and it looks amazing. It, it, it's a lot faster and easier than having to torch it multiple times. Um, and so that's a huge benefit of our resin. But this board's ready to be pulled. It's been about an hour, uh, maybe hour, 20 minutes. So we're just gonna pull the tape now. And this should pull just like really easy because we use the blue tape. And you can kind of see how far on the edge we taped. Now this is, this technique's really only for really thin boards, maybe some art panels on aluminum boards, stuff like that. If you, if you have a, like a counter edge, you wanna tape it like we show you for that stuff, but. So another thing I wanna hit on is if you guys are sanding and filling your edges, make sure you use Bondo um, and then sand it smooth and then wipe it really clean. You gotta clean your edges really, really well, especially if you're taping on it over the primer. If you don't, you run the chance of the primer peeling off on sections when you pull that tape because it didn't bond because you had dust or debris between the primer and the wood. So make sure you really clean your edges good um, and you won't have any issues with it pulling the primer off. So now, what we do is we just need to get rid of this surface tension, right? So this can start flowing out. So once we get our tape pulled, we're trying to get rid of that surface tension so this material can flow over the edge. And I'm just kind of brushing it, brushing it onto the edge here, like so. Trying not to get too far out. 
right? I don't want to like start pulling from back here. I want to just be right here on the edge. Once I kind of pull that to the edge, it'll start to flow over. So you can tell we got a thick spot here. I can just kind of brush that in. So once this dry surface gets kind of slicked off with that resin, it'll start to level out to that edge and slowly flow over and coat our edges really nice. So right here's kind of where I started. It's already starting to pull. Where my, my marks was from pulling it was up, up on this area. Now it's all the way kind of to the edge. So we'll let that start to flow over slowly and then we just keep slicking off any dry spots. And then a little tip for you, if you've waited too long and the resin is not really wanting to drip down the edge, if you heat that up with like a blow dryer, put it on hot, start to kind of heat up that resin, it'll, it'll start to flow over. But if you look by letting it set up like that, we had these edges are really thick. They have a thick layer of resin on them. That's kind of what we're looking for. We'll let this level itself out flow over the edge and then we'll scrape our drips. And it's always good to kind of check your edges periodically over the next hour or so as it's kind of flowing over, making sure you don't have any imperfections. You can always touch stuff up like that. Um, so don't just assume your edges are gonna look perfect once you're done. Um, always come back and double check them if you can. That way you don't have to fix any imperfections in those edges or faces. So we're ready to apply the top coat. We're gonna be using our gloss urethane with our grit additive for extreme durability, um, added scratch resistance, stuff like that. Now, this sat here for about two days, so we wound up sanding it all because we wanna scuff it up. If, if the resin sits longer than 24 hours, you wanna scuff up the surface with 220 grit, 320 grit, some, some super fine sandpaper, palm sander. Just be careful when you guys are sanding your edges your corners, do those by hand, be real careful because you don't want to sand through those. If you wind up sanding through them, typically you can just take some spray paint, a Sharpie if you have black spots and kind of touch those spots up. But um, as long as you just go slow and use that really fine 220, 320 grit, you shouldn't have any issues. And this, this is a counter kit urethane, so it'll do 50 square feet. So I'm just gonna mix up half instead of just wasting it all. This is about 20 square feet, so we should have a little extra. The roller's gonna soak up some. So I'm just gonna basically split this kit into two and it's 20 ounces. So we have 15 ounces of part A, five ounces of part B, and then I'll just split the grit and mix it up. So shake these up a little bit. We're gonna make about 12 ounces, so I'm gonna go so I'm gonna be using a measuring container that has the ratio marks, um, and I need about 12 ounces or so. So I'm gonna go to the three to one area and do two part A, and then for the one, I'm gonna do the two mark, and that's gonna give us about 13 ounces, which is a little extra, but that's all right. So that's what I'm gonna mix up. So we're gonna add our A to the three, to one mark and we're gonna go to the two line, which is right there. Shake up that B and then we're gonna go, we're on the three line, now we're gonna go to the one mark, the one line and the two, number two mark. And then we're looking at about maybe 14 ounces. So I'm gonna add 1.4 ounces of water Get that mixed in a little bit and then we'll add the grit. All right, we're gonna split the grit up. It's good to mix, when you're using the grit additive, to mix it with the drill, just so it doesn't get clumpy. All right, so I'm using a three eighths nap roller. Make sure you de-shed these, and then we're gonna be using a roller tray, kind of dip and roll out of. Applying the urethanes is really simple, and it just adds a lot of durability to your surfaces for scratch resistance. Now the grit additive will tone the high gloss sheen down a little bit on the gloss urethane, um, but it still will have a, have a glossy sheen. It just won't be as high gloss when you add this grit additive. And we're gonna apply it like we always do. Take a second, soak the roller up and then I'll roll a bead down the middle and then I'll cross roll that and then do my back rolls and kind of move on. You always want to do smaller sections at a time. 
that we always have fresh material. If you try to coat this whole table, by the time you get everything rolled out, you're gonna have, you're probably gonna have roller lines. So always try to do sections, smaller sections, and kind of work on down your project. So I'm not worried about roller lines. I'm just trying to thin this out, get a good, thin, even coat everywhere. Hit my edges. And then I can focus on the top. Flatten that roller out. And then I'll do my final back rolls. And that's it, we just kind of repeat that process. And that's it, so biggest thing we're looking for is like thick roller edges, we wanna feather those out. And if you guys, I'll kind of show you a trick. If you're having, if you're having a tough time with this edge, leaving thick edges, just kind of push that edge off to get the product off of that edge. And then go do your final back roll. You can see all the excess that came off of this and it'll kind of feather out that edge. Um, so that's, if you're, if you're having a hard time with that, but this should lay out no roller lines. And again, with that grit additive, it's gonna add a lot of durability, scratch resistance, um, and gonna hold up really good to wear and tear. So we'll let this set up, uh, maybe put a fan on it, and then we'll show you guys the, the final, final footage of this thing when it's all done.